Hey guys, if you're watching this, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you are blue collar and you want to share your story on our podcast, make sure you let us know in the comments. We are always looking for guests. And also, we want your feedback. So make sure you leave your feedback in the comments. Tell us how you like the podcast. Uh, yeah, keep watching. So today we're here with Devin. Devin, where are you calling from, man? Uh, Jasper, Alabama. Alabama, all right. Yeah. You ain't too far from us. We're down in Florida. Oh, yeah, that's not far at all. Yeah. All right, so, Devin, what do you do for a living? Um, I'm a welder by trade. All right, how long you been doing that? Oh, Lord. I think the dinosaurs are still roaming. <laughs> um, all in all, uh, I guess going on my 13th year. 13? How old are you? 31. Damn, dude, you've been in it for a good minute then, yeah. Right, right. Right out of school. So you yeah, did, did you do, that was my next question, is um, for high school, you finished high school? Yeah. And uh, did you go straight into the trade school, or did you just go straight apprentice? No, nah, I went straight to work. You, all right, yeah, so you went right into my, it. Uh, my, my dad, my granddad, um, uncles, they were all union iron workers. And growing up, you know, I was always told, don't, don't do this, don't do what we do, you know, go to school, get an office job. I'm growing up seeing y'all do this, and I'm just like that. That looks awesome. Like that's what I want to do when exactly. I grow up. So when I graduated, I told my dad I was like, well, because I had a scholarship for football, and I tore my knee up. Well, scholarship disappeared, and I told dad I was like, well, since you know I'm not going to school to play ball anymore, I'm going to go to work. And he's like, what are you going to do? And I was like, I'm going to be a welder. And his head just dropped. <laughs> He was like, please pick anything else. I was like, I'm not flipping burgers. And I don't really know how to do anything else. Like, I'm going to go well. And uh, I actually said something about a trade school. And he was like, no. He was like, you're not wasting money on that. He was like, anything that you can learn in a classroom, you can learn on the job for free. And get paid to learn it. So they're in Boilermakers, Apprenticeship, um, I, I'd actually worked for another company um, in the coal mine um, for two years. And that was where I kind of, you know, got my feet wet, learned how to weld, and then ended up joining the Boilermakers year three out of high school. And I was, it was like starting school all over again. Well, out in the mines, because, you know, I'm a former rock miner. Okay. I do a lot of welding too mechanic operator i did it all yeah. but out in the mines when you're welding man it's all rust it's all yeah nothing. not clean nothing i mean you really do learn real quick what you can make stick and what won't work yeah i've got a friend he he actually went through um the bevel state welding uh, course here where we live and when he got out i'm already sixth year in welding like now I've, I've seen some stuff you know i know pretty good bit and he gets out and he's like yeah man i'm a real welder i've got certifications and i was like well, let me ask you something i said if you welded on anything rusty wet dirty covered in coal covered in mud and he was like no i was like everything that y'all welded on was you know pretty clean New, he was like, oh, yeah, everything we went on was brand new metal. I was like, dude, just tear those papers up. They don't mean anything. Yeah, no, you're in a whole new world. You ain't in classroom anymore. He he doesn't even weld anymore. He welded for about six months, and now he's trying to start his own construction business. <laughs> so that goes along with our, our saying on our apparel is, you know, it's a blood type. And it is. like you said, your whole family, you generations in the blue collar world. And it is. It's a blood type. You either got it or you don't. It's You're going to get it and make it through the blue collar industries or you're going to quit real quick because yeah. it is not for everybody. And that ain't easy. Dad always said you're either going to get bit by the bug or you're going to drop out. Yeah, you're either going to love every second of it. And when I say love every second, it is a love-hate in this world. It is... <laughs> Oh, you go home sure. cussing and yelling about this job. Fuck this place. But the next morning you wake up and you're like, what are we doing today? I got this. Yeah. Yeah. 
Like you go to bed, like I'm I'm quitting in the morning. My boss is an asshole. Yeah. And you wake up the next morning and you're like, all right, let's go see what's going on. Exactly. That's that's and when that's, you know you got it. That's what I try telling people, like younger guys that's come in. I've I've been the foreman for two different companies, and one of them they kept hiring very young, like guys straight out of high school, 18, 19 years old, you know, don't know nothing, still green behind the ears. And we had had a couple just rough days. Um, this company, one company in particular, we were working in the mines again. Um, we were above ground doing all of the maintenance, the steel work uh, in one of the prep plants. So, I mean, we were changing out steel beams. We were putting up handrails. We were changing out electric motors when they went out. We weren't just welders. I mean, we were, we were, we do it all. Yeah. We were welder millwrights basically. And, um, we had had about a string of three days. I mean, it was just horrible. We ended up working a 19 and a half hour day after working a 16 hour day the day before. Yeah. And when we got in the truck, one of them was like, man, I can't do this anymore. Like, I I don't want to just leave you hanging, but like I'm done after today. And I was like, man, I was like, just not every day is going to be like this. And he was like, well, no, we've had, you know, three or four. And I was like, Again, not every day is going to be like this. You're going to have stretches of good. You're going to have stretches of bad. Exactly. It comes with the job. I mean, you never know what you're going to get into one day to the next. But that's the good part about it. You're constantly doing something different. Yeah, you're working never in a blue collar field. Machine. Yeah, working in a blue collar field, you're never going to be doing the same thing unless you work in a fab shop. Yeah. Uh, you you're constantly going to see something new. You're always going to get the if you like to learn you're constantly going to be able to scratch that itch because there's always going to be something like you've never seen before. Okay. So how do we fix this? And I talked to him the whole ride home and we finally got back to Jasper and he was like, all right, man, I'll see y'all in the morning. And I was like, I thought you were quitting. And he was like, no, he was like, I, it was, I'm just in a bad mood. I'll see y'all in the morning. He come to work the next day. We had a gravy day. We had to install like three pieces of handrail. He was the happiest kid I've ever seen in my life, especially when he got that paycheck the next week. Yeah, that's what, that's what really matters. You know, if you're in it for that first week, two weeks, you know, how you get paid, that first two weeks or week is going to really test you. Oh, yeah. But once that paycheck hits, you're like, that's where you the know, bug I think I can keep going with this. Yeah, that's where the bug bite comes in. <laughs> yeah. But it's funny you say that, you know, working in the mine – you know, you weren't just the welder, you did everything. Yeah. In my experience working in the mine, it didn't matter what your label was. When something broke, it was all hands on deck and it didn't, you know, there was no, I'm just a welder. No. No, I don't care. Get up there and do that. And that's how it was there. Yeah. I mean, because you say that, there's a lot of people that, you know, may have not worked in a, a mining industry or like an underground mine before. And, you know, there's a lot. My wife, she's actually going to school for mine engineering. Really? And, yeah. She's she's always been real interested in you know mining, like the brotherhood that goes along with it. And then when me and her yeah. got together, I was actually working underground, and she got to see a closer look into it because all of her family, you know, they're not not really anybody's blue collar. Her granddad, you know, he's a farmer, so, you know, we'll count him in with it. But the rest of her family, you know, they're all high corporate managers, you know, things like that. So she got a closer insight to the blue collar lifestyle of mining when we got together. And she decided she was like, you know, I'm I'm going back to school. I'm going to be a mine engineer. And I just looked at her and I was like, baby, you know, builders and electricians and you know we hate engineers right <laughs> yes. she's like what do you mean i was like i have never worked on a single thing in life that an engineer done that worked like it was supposed that, to yeah well on paper it fit together perfect oh, yeah. it's paper. always great on paper <laughs> yeah. oh that's the truth you're doing that's that 100%. My says you're doing that wrong yeah yeah, yeah. So she, she actually decided that she was going for mine engineering and she has this theory that 
she'll just come to me for advice whenever they're designing something and I can tell her all the ways that it won't work. And I was like, that's, that's never going to work, baby. That's hilarious. Yeah. yeah it ain't going to work. My husband said this isn't going to work at yeah. all. Yeah. <laughs> How does he know? So she said, um, cause she's actually got, um, an internship with, um, I can't remember who it is now, but she's got an internship with somebody. And she said, if she got hired on after the internship, she was like, the only way I'm coming is if my husband comes with me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we're a package deal. That's hilarious. So you're married. You just said you're married. Do you have any kids? Four. Four kids. Yeah. And you Not started quick, didn't you? I I took the uh the blue collar <laughs> the <laughs> blue collar cliche of divorces and and yeah, I took that to heart. <laughs> I've got um I've got an ex wife and I've got two daughters with her. Um and then I've got Two boys with their, both of their mothers. So, got four kids and three baby mothers. I get them paychecks really coming in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They they love uh, anytime I say, "Well, yeah, I'm going to this job because they're offering per diem and you know set amount of dollars an hour." And they're like, "Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect." I can't complain though. They're they're pretty laid back. I've actually got full custody of my daughters, so that's awesome. Their their mom had some substance abuse issues, and um, DHR actually stepped in and took them out of the home, placed them with me full custody. So I've got them twenty four seven. That's a whole other side of working blue collar when you've got full custody of your kids. Yeah, and right now. You know, while my wife's in school or going to school, it's kind of just me and the girls just trying to balance, you know, work, getting them to school, babysitters in the evenings if I've got to work over. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, what kind of what's your average hours right now at work? Right now, I've the company that I'm with now, I've actually got a pretty sweet setup. We work Monday to Friday, six thirty AM, two thirty PM most days. So, you know, we get eight in the gate, occasional overtime every now and then, but I'm actually, next Wednesday, I have to go sit down and have an interview with another company a friend of mine works for. He just got promoted. So his spot, he's a, that's, he's a welding millwright, basically. Uh, okay. He was the mechanical division supervisor. Well, he just got promoted to the mechanical division manager. So his job is his old job is open, and he spoke with the owner and was like, "Hey, you know, me and this guy have worked together. He's actually run jobs for me before. So I got to talk to him." And when he mentioned thirty eight dollars an hour and one hundred twenty dollars a day per diem, my ears perked up. So how far is that away from your house? Um, I think their office is 45 minutes. That's not bad. No, I'm driving like an hour and hour and five right now to work. So for your job, have you done a lot of traveling? Yeah. Um, I've actually, I've worked on the pipeline, um, out in West Texas. I worked in New Braunfels, Midland, um, worked out there for about a year and a half. Um, I loved it. I love, you know, the culture, the, the brotherhood, the camaraderie. You know, yeah. It was, it was great. And then when me and my ex got pregnant with our first little girl, it was one of those, you know, I've, I'm working with guys that, you know, they're constantly telling me how they've missed birthdays. They've missed first yeah. steps, first Christmases, first words. And it was just. Uh Oh, well, we lost them. Let's see if he comes back. He might have had a phone call. Oh. You have a phone call? Yeah. Yeah, we, we've had that happen before. It's no big deal, man. <laughs> it's uh, real life. It was, uh, it said, uh, public, 
Publico, Mexico, or I don't, I don't know anybody in Mexico. Um, but it was just one of those, you know, working around guys that, you know, had already been through it, you know, telling me, oh, you're going to miss birthdays, you're going to miss first words, first days of school. I'd already had enough money saved up, and I knew I could get a job, you know, back home doing the same, same kind of work. It was just one of those where we talked, and I was like, look, I'm not willing – to miss out on all this. So I left the pipeline, come home, started working in the mines. That was, went back or went back to the mines. Um, so my cousin, he was the foreman over a company. He brought me in, no questions asked, gave me top out pay right off the bat. And uh, just kind of took it from there. And I think that was, 2016, I think, um, the bonds actually filed bankruptcy and my, uh, contractors, you know, they're the first ones to go trying to cut down yeah. on costs. They're, they're going to get rid of contractors and keep their guys in house. Yeah. So I ended up getting laid off and went over the road with, that was when I joined, I joined the Bullermakers Union. Okay. Went over the road with them. My first job was at home, which wasn't that bad. It was at um, the steam plant right up the road. I mean, it was I was thirty minutes from the house. That's nice. Yeah, done seven twelves for three months. You know, killer money. I loved it. Well, as soon as that outage was over, we were thinking there's another steam plant about an hour and a half away, and they had an outage scheduled. So we're all thinking, you know, we'll just leave here and go over there and still be, you know, relatively close to the house. No, I, as soon as the, as soon as the first outage was over, we left and my next call out was somewhere in the middle of Arkansas. I couldn't even remember where it was at. Um, it was at a steel mill. Okay. Done that. I was there for probably about a month straight left. I mean, it was just, it was one of those. Uh, with the buller makers, if they don't have a lot of work going on in house and in Alabama, they really don't. You've got a handful of steam plants, and past that, uh, the buller makers really don't have enough work in state to keep you in state. So, the majority of the time, you're going to be traveling. And they've since shut down two of our um, coal fired steam plants. So, I mean, the works, it's even less now than it was back then. There's guys that are jumping out of the the Buller Makers Union left and right just because there's not enough work. Yeah. To, yeah you gotta you know, go where the money's at. Yeah, just to sustain life. Um, well, I've done that for about two years, and then me and my ex split up. Talked with my parents, and they're like, you know, we'll help you. You know, whatever you need to do work wise, you know, we'll help you out. So I ended up hitting the road again doing industrial maintenance and i've done that for about a year and it was just i mean constantly three weeks at a time come home for five six seven days at most hit the road again three weeks at a time and most of the time it was you know, just week-long shutdowns at each place but we're leaving one place going to the next and not seeing home for three weeks yeah it gets old quick yeah i mean having to see your kids through a phone screen is gets old yeah especially when you know they start school and they come home and oh daddy look what we made and they're having to you know hold it up in front of the phone screen it's, yeah it, it really it tears at you yeah no i agree <clears throat> so in a steam plant what were you doing in a steam plant uh, i know nothing about oil makers and yeah. steam plants i've never done anything like that so it's just uh, curious so with the buller makers you're doing essentially you're just you're rebuilding you know the coal fired steam boiler so depending on what specific part of the boiler that you're working on they may be um like the first job i ever worked on was uh the precipitator for um unit two at miller steam plant and basically 
the way the boiler works is you've got you know a fire underneath coal fire going you've got pipes with water running through it like you'll have water come in this side and imagine just a big wall and you've got you know pipes they're all connected but you've got pipe going up coming down up down and it just it makes a big snake yeah so water runs through it you know coal coal fire underneath it's going produces the steam steam comes out of the pipe spins a turbine makes power it's way above my pay grade but <laughs> that's the general concept of it <laughs> but as far as the boiler maker side of it just depending on what you're doing like the unit two precip job we replaced all of the boiler tubes i mean there were thousands of tig welders in there i mean from ohio california texas like you were meeting people from all walks of life from all over the country and then you've got um they were redoing the skin on the outside strengthening the skin up putting in stiffener plates new pieces of plate where it needed it so you've got guys inside you know tig welding boiler tubes you've got guys on the outside mig welding um stiffener plates and skins on the outside and then the an rde curtain so an rde curtain is essentially a it's a like a curtain of pipes but they're all like they're not connected they're all singular pipes okay but they've got galvanized like nails sticking out of the sides of them and they shoot electric current through it and it arcs off the inside of the boiler and it just knocks down all the dust from the coal being burned underneath it. Oh, so wow. we had a crew doing that and it's wild. Like if you can ever find a video of it, um, like in the process of doing it, it's wild to watch because when they first told us about it, like, I was trying to imagine it and it's exactly how I imagine, like imagine just one big lightning storm inside of a boiler and it's just arcing off of everything. That's crazy. Yeah. Terrifying at the uh, same time. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we had a or they had a crew uh, doing the RDE curtain so I actually had to go help them and they were welding on um, sneak by plates for the gas flow and I had to do that and then doing the alignment for the RDE curtains and I don't know if you've ever been poked by a galvanized nail it sucks I don't think so <laughs> I, mean, I don't think so yeah, that was my first time because um, they kept telling me they was like, you know, don't don't let those poke you. And that was all they'd say. And I'm thinking, well, like, yeah, you know, they're sharp. It's going to hurt. You know, it's no big deal. I ended up getting poked by one. Didn't think anything about it. Didn't say anything to anybody. You know, didn't want to do an accident report. Um, went home the next morning. I woke up. My arm was swollen, red, sore. What's the horrible. reason for it? Um, it's the chemicals that they use to put the galvanized coat on it. Yeah. And your body just has an adverse reaction to it. I come back to work the next day and my, my foreman just looked at me and he said, you got poked, didn't you? <laughs> You're like, no, I don't yeah. know what you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, really funny story. That same job. This was a couple days prior. Um, they were trying to weld the adjustment bracket down below the curtains. And I mean, you've got a hole, maybe a foot wide that you've got to get down into to weld the bracket on. And it's all, it's all mid gun. So, I mean, if you can get close, you can just point squeeze and, you know, do what you got to do. Well, we had one guy that was trying to do it and he was like, I'm not tall enough. I can't reach down there. I'm six, eight. So of course they I was call me. Ask you because yeah, I watched one of your videos on TikTok. And I'm sorry to interrupt you on this, but I see one of your videos where you were with two buddies in your kitchen. And he steps in front of the camera, and I'm like, "God's oh, a big yeah. dude." And then the other guy steps in front, and you come from behind. I'm like, "Holy shit, that man is huge, bro!" Yeah. So I was yeah, wondering, that... like, how much is it a bitch to get into these tight places, being oh, you know, it, a it big is. dude? It's a whole bitch. I couldn't imagine because when I was doing welding and stuff, get in them small places. You know, I'm not tall by any means. I'm like five eight. <laughs> and it was like times I was like, this fucking sucks. 
And then yeah. watching you and finding out you're a welder, I was like, God, the, the obstacles yeah. a man has to go through. It sucks. Everybody's like, it must be so nice to be tall. <laughs> no, I'd rather be a midget. Like, <laughs> my, I feel like my perfect body type, like if I could go back and do it myself, to be a welder would be Bridget the Midget. In Short, every compact, stubby, just carry around a little step stool with me and just pop it out, climb up, start welding. Perfect. Yeah, not but, six uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the guy was like, you know, I'm not tall enough. I can't reach it. And, of course, Walt and Bobby were like, we know who to call. They hollered at me on the radio, and they was like, hey, come up here, you know, unit two pre-step, um, west side RDE curtains. I'm like, okay. So to get up there and I walk in and Bobby's just smiling. And I was like, what, what, what do I have to do? And he said, you see that hole down there? And I looked and I said, yeah. He said, you have to get in there and weld that clip on the bottom. I'm not thinking anything about it. You know, at the time I'm six, eight, you know, 250 pounds. So, I mean, I was a little slimmer, you know, to be that tall, you know, the weight didn't look as bad. So, you know, I go and grab my hood, grab everything, and technically, according to Southern Company standards, you're supposed to be tied off going into any kind of hole like that. It was like a four foot drop. I wasn't going anywhere at six eight. So, yeah, you're supposed I to be just, tied off after six foot. So, yeah, and that's <laughs> that, like any any time I'm in a safety meeting back. Like, the safety man will always, he'll look around the room as he's talking. And he's like, you have to be tied off over six foot. And then they see me and they're like, <laughs> except for you, you have to be tied off after nine feet. Yeah. And which kills me is because, you know, they're always like, oh, after six foot, you have to be tied off. But your lanyard don't stretch out. You hit the ground first. So yeah. what's the point? That's, <laughs> I've never understood that because most lanyards, you know, like you just said, most they lanyards stretch. have a six foot stretch on them. Yeah. So if I tie off after six foot, I'm still hitting the ground. I'm going to break an ankle, roll an ankle. It's going to do more harm than good as verse or as opposed to me just falling and catching myself. Yeah. I and never then, understood it either because I was like, you're laying your. It don't make no sense. Unless you've got on a yo yo, that's the only time I could see it being beneficial. Yeah, because then it will ratchet stop. Click. Yeah, and then yo yos hurt. <laughs> Yeah, you ain't getting none of that that stretch to it, that rebound. Oh, no. But um, I climbed down in the hole, welded everything up. I was down there for about 10 minutes. Uh, I was kind of like, I was up to my chest right here, and I was kind of leaned over to where I could reach it. And I'm just sitting there, you know, welding 10, 15 minutes, get done, and I'm like, okay, cool. So I throw all my stuff up, and I go to try to pull out, well, I'd been wedged in between the RDE curtain and a solid four foot thick steel wall for so long that my chest had swelled <laughs> and I got stuck. <laughs> so How the fuck did your chest swell that big? I don't know. I mean Damn. it was tight, it was tight getting in there. Like I had to like shimmy myself down in there yeah. to get in. And I guess just me being bent over. And like having still plate on the front, RDE curtain on the back pushing into me, like, and then me breathing on top of it, like my chest had swell, swollen up, and I I could not get out. Like I put my arms up, and they tried to pull me out, and it it wasn't coming. So how'd you get so out? Was, I'm sitting there, and I looked at Walt and Bobby, and I was like, I know we're not cutting RDE curtain out, and they're like, No, absolutely not. Like that's a million dollars worth of work. Like we're not cutting that out. Yeah, you'll so stay like, there. Okay. Yeah, you'll stay there forever. <laughs> um, so I'm sitting there and I'm like, how are y'all going to get me out? And Bobby looked at one of the other guys. He said, go get me a one-ton uh, chain fall. Come along. Oh, yeah. So they go and get a chain fall and they put a harness on me just enough to where they could get it under my arms, back around, and <laughs> hooked it to they the hooked the chain fall to the roof down to the... Uh, down to the harness and they're all over there just winching on the chain pulling me up and about the time they get me up safety man walks by <laughs> so many questions were asked 
I couldn't even imagine like that. What are you doing? Like right yeah. off the bat, what are you doing? I, no one's gonna video of it, right? Nah, I wish I did. <laughs> like just to see me at that, six eight. Yes, that would be absolutely yes. You know, the other guys on the side just running that chain and you're just coming up <laughs> slowly but slowly. Like a giant uh marionette doll. <laughs> that would have been hilarious to watch. My God. After we explained to him what happened, and he was he was kind of like, okay, just don't do that again. Find somebody smaller for the job next time, and we're just like, that That still left us with another problem. Like, you're either too big and you're going to get stuck, or you're too small and you ain't going to be able to reach it. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you do uh, more of for welding? Do you do stick more, MIG, or uh, TIG? Currently... Um, we're leaning more towards stick. I mean, most of the time now it's stick. We're, um, we're actually at a Coke plant where they burn, you know, the coal to make Coke, to make steel. Um, so everything's outdoors. You know, most of the time we're on top of a roof somewhere welding on, you know, a steam line or a gas line. Um, so it's not really beneficial, you know, to use me because then you're going to have to carry, you know, the box, the balls, yeah. everything else. Normally, we just use stick now. Um, they actually do have, you know, like their little home base um, shop top deal that they have where they do a lot of MIG, you know, solid wire MIG welding as long as it's in the shop. But actually out in the field, it's nine times out of ten, it's going to be all stick. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I did mo- more of is stick. That's MIG yeah. now and then. Just like you said, you had to carry the box around. Yeah. Around yeah. When 25. I was working in the box, it was, it was all stick when uh, I was working underground. Have you ever seen the battery powered uh, welders? Did y'all have one of those? No, I had the big Miller on the yeah. truck. Um, they had a. Um, I've never seen a battery powered one. It was just a little small. I mean, it looked like a suitcase. And it took two batteries that look like you know the big 12.0 milwaukee batteries yeah you um took two of those and you could burn about seven rods with it on a full charge they had them for like one of those places where like if they you know were expanding the mine to a new spot and you know didn't have power run down there yet didn't have welders close by or they couldn't get the welding skid down there they would just give you that little suitcase welder and you just carried it off with you. And I mean, it, it literally came in a backpack. And That's wild. Just, yeah. You could just strap it on your back and go where you needed. And as long as it was anything small, you know, just like simple little repair. Yeah. It was great. Cause like I said, you're getting like seven or eight rods at it. If you were welding with one eighth rods, you're getting about seven to eight rods out of it. If you're using three thirty twos, uh, I think the most I ever got out of it was like 14 rods. So, I mean, it's, it was, it was kind of cool, you know, just to have. Yeah. If you're in a bind, that's yeah. awesome. I mean, it blew I've never mind. heard of that. That's awesome. No, they like the first time they said something about, it, they said battery powered welder. And I was like, dude, what? <laughs> what are you speaking? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> talking like, how, about? How is this going to work? And then they brought it out and I was like, you're kidding. Right? And they're like, no, like it, it really runs off of batteries. You were waiting for him to walk out with like a 24 volt with some jumper cable. Yeah. You were like, yeah. I got this. <laughs> Here, just just tap this into the to the yeah. power cable on the miner. Yeah, I got that. Don't worry. We'll hook up them jumper cables. We'll get you done. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. So as of right now, you're not doing steam plants anymore. You're doing uh Yeah. Is it like refineries? Yeah, it's it's almost like a refinery top. Um, like I said, they just they only burn coal. But if you've seen the setup of the plant, like it almost looks like an oil refinery. Yeah. Because you know, burning coal, you've got byproducts that come off of burning coal. So we've got liquor tanks where you know the liquor comes off of burning coal. We've got. Um, the sulfur that comes off of burning it, they collect. 
Um, ammonia sulfate, you know, is a byproduct. Everybody uses it for fertilizer. We get that as a byproduct. Um, one of the other really cool, just wonderful byproducts of burning coal that I did not know is cyanide and arsenic. So that was great. That's great. Yeah. We were at work a couple of weeks ago and uh, one of the plant hands walked by and he said, why does that water look green? And I didn't know that cyanide when mixed with water looks like you took a yellow highlighter and busted it on the ground. So it's really easy to spot. Jesus. Yeah. They had to call in um, because they don't actually have a hazmat, um, like a hazmat team on site up there. They had to call in an outside company and wait for them to like, we had to go rope it all off and just kind of stand guard until the hazmat team got there. And all they done was they literally brought a vac truck and just sucked up the water off the ground. <laughs> it was like, all right, guys, thanks. Go. Have a good day. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question for you. Once again, look at your videos. Tell me how you get ready in the morning at work to start your day. Do you shotgun a Red Bull? I, <laughs> I, I seen your video you and I was, Red Bull. Dude, I was dying. Oh yeah. That's an it's an every morning tradition, actually. <laughs> every morning that I have not shotgunned a Red Bull, we have had the absolute worst days. Worst days. Yeah, so now it's just kind of one of those like superstitious things where like we get to work every morning and I just grab my Red Bull, poke a hole in it, and shotgun it. What a gangster! And bro. it's always great, like if I go to a new company or you know we're working around new guys new that's never that's never seen me do it before. Like we'll be standing around like doing our morning safety brief, and I'll just walk over to the cooler, grab a Red Bull, and everybody's thinking like, oh, okay, you know he's gonna drink a Red Bull. And then, like, somebody will be talking, and then just all of a sudden you'll hear that. <laughs> and I get it right here, and about the time I go to turn it up, everybody's like, oh, my God, what is he doing? Yeah, what is this dude doing? <laughs> Jesus. I try to keep it fun at work. Cause, you have I mean, to. You, you know, I was going to say, you know, yeah, it's it's all of, it's not even the job. Like, it's who you work with. If you That's work with somebody that. You know, they're serious 24-7. They're always in a bad mood. You know, it's always negative. You're you're going to hate your job as much as they do. Because yeah. you have to work with them. So, I mean, no matter what I've got going on in my personal life, if work sucks, you know, I hate my job, I still try to crack jokes, you know, make somebody laugh, smile. Because at the end of the day, I mean, you don't know what that person's going through. You know, they could be having a worse time than you at home. And work is their escape. So, I mean, it just goes back to that, you know, try to make somebody smile. You know, don't say anything if you can't say nothing nice at all. Because if my mother heard half the things that I said at work, she would probably beat me. Yeah, because I was just going to say, you know, I worked with I worked with some awesome people. And uh, a couple of guys I worked with, you know, you're doing these jobs. And you can be in it. I know we had a machine break one time and I was already at work for 14 hours. And by the time I left work, I put in 23 and a half hours for the day. Mm. And at that point of it breaking almost off my shift, you did not want to be around me. No. And man, we were tossing out each other, throwing pools. Next day, come in and it's just bullshit in the game. What's happening, man? Yeah, like nothing ever happened. You're like threatening somebody's life, like I will rip your damn head <laughs> off. And then you come in the next morning, like, hey man, you want a biscuit? Yeah, yeah. You get breakfast for me? No, I didn't get breakfast for you. Yeah. Hey, so, man, did you bring me a greasy coat this morning? I do want to get on once again one of your videos because you have so many good videos on your TikTok that I want to get in on to one that. It did, it hit home pretty hard for me. And that was the video you put up talking about, you know, the ins and outs of this blue collar world and the dangers and a loved one receiving that phone call that no one wants to hear. And, you know, my wife, she received that phone call and it does hit home. It's, it's a scary thought. And I know a lot of us don't think about it. You go into work, you do what you do. 
you know, we do have the safety guy, which we all don't care for. But he is there to help as yeah. much as we don't care for him. You know, like you said, you know, we're not doing the same thing every single day at work. But we do have that routine that you kind of get used to going into work. It's the same. Uh, what's a word I'm looking for? Scenery. Right? You know, you get into it and you forget. You forget a lot of times that, you know, I've done this a thousand times. I'll go and do it again. But there's a chance that you might not come home or you might come home really fucked up. Yeah. So I did really, really like that video you put because it shows the awareness and it maybe will open someone else's eyes. I hope it does. Yeah, the 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 reasoning behind that video, um, I was at work and this was when I was working with um, the Boilermakers. And this goes back to the the harness deal and the tying off. Um, we were working on top of the Unit 2 precip. And like you said, it was one of those things where, you know, done this job a hundred times, you know, it's going to take five minutes. I'm not walking two stories down to put on a damn harness. Like, I'm going to hop up here, get it done, get it over with. Yeah. Um. And that's what we had been doing all week. I mean, it was one of those, you know, it won't take five minutes. What it was, was they were flying in the top stack for um, the precip. And once they got it up there, you had to get down in the hole, walk across the beam, and you had to unhook the shackles and, you know, all the rigging. And it was one of those, like, you know, the whole team that I was working with, you know, we had been working together for, at this point, you know, almost a year. We all knew each other. We were like, you know, hell, the safety man's not up here. You don't tell, I won't tell. We would just hop down in the hole, do what we had to do, get out. And one of the guys that we were working with had fell earlier that day. And luckily for him, like, he landed on the beam. He straddled the beam. Um, he quite literally busted his nuts, but... Past that, I mean, he was, he was, he was lucky. And after that, you know, we were all like, okay, because it had been kind of sprinkling that morning, you know, all the steel was wet, slick. After that, we were all kind of like, okay, well, you know, as long as it's, you know, kind of wet up here, you know, we'll put on a harness, you know, just be careful, whatever. Because the fall, if you fell off the steel, it was about 200 foot to the bottom. And you would be slapping those RD curtains yep. the whole way down. Um, it was the last hookup of the day before we were getting off. We had like 10 minutes to go to a quitting time. They were flying up the last piece for the day. And I jumped down in the hole and made it over. And I'd unhooked. And I had my harness hooked up to the rat line. I'd unhooked the rig and turned and was headed to walk back. And one of the other guys took his rigging loose and when he let the shackle go, it slung back and hit me in the back of the head and knocked me off balance. And I'm sure you know how big a five ton shackle is. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's yeah. as big as your head. Hit me in the back of the head, knocked me off balance and I actually fell off the beam. And luckily I had my harness on. The harness caught and I was hanging there for probably about 30 minutes while, you know, cause of course they had to, you know, go holler yeah. for safety and holler for, you know, all, everybody that they needed to holler for. To and, get you down. Yeah. The whole time, because there was no way to get up from the bottom. Cause it was, you know, so far up that they couldn't pull me up from the top, not standing on the beam. So they were trying to devise a plan, how to get me out. And, I just kept hollering at them. I was like, just lower the damn crane down here and I'll hook myself up. And they're like, no, we can't do that. That's against OSHA standards. I'm sitting here hanging. I don't give a shit about OSHA standards. Yeah, so me, finally, after about, yeah, after about 30 minutes, because I was working with a different crew during this job, and um, I told them, I said, call Bobby up here. Well, they finally called Bobby and they got him up there. And I was like, tell the crane man to lower one of them pieces of rigging down here with a shackle on it. I said, I'm going to hook it up. And he was like, all right, I got you. 
And they're like, no, we can't do that. Bobby said, I don't give a shit. He said, I've got a man hanging. He needs to be brought up. We're going to do what we got to do. They lowered a like one inch thick steel choker and a five ton shackle. And I hooked it up to my harness, pulled me out, no problem. And I don't know if you've ever fell while being on a harness, but no. for, I think it's for every five minutes that you're hanging, you have to lay down flat on the ground for 10 minutes. Yeah, because it cuts the circulation off to your legs. Yeah. I have heard and a so, lot. Yeah, that and they don't can, want you getting a blood clot. Yeah, it can. You yeah. can actually have your legs amputated because of hanging yeah. in the harness for so long. Yeah. So Which, once again, <laughs> it's that blue collar life. Even you being safe and wearing the safety yeah. harness, there is a chance that you could still be very hurt in the end. Yeah, Maybe and that's not, what a lot of people don't yeah. realize. Like, you can do everything right. You can do everything by the book. You can follow every safety guideline, every precaution that the company's got. The company, OSHA, MSHA, whoever. You can follow every possible safety guideline and protocol. And in this line of work, you can you can do everything right and you can still lose your life. That's the Thank harsh you. reality of it. Absolutely awesome. <clears throat> That's So I have a good buddy of mine that he actually did safety training and he wanted to be a safety man and he ended up didn't going through with it but he did all the courses and everything and he used to tell us all the time you there's no such thing as a hundred percent safe no. it doesn't exist it's not real you could be 99 percent safe but there's always going to be a one percent chance that a freak accident could happen shit breaks we yeah. work on stuff all day every day we should know that there's a chance that it can break. And yeah, I mean, just like you said, that you can't be 100% safe. It's not going to work. So no. I always tell people, always be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of your coworkers' surroundings. You know, look out for one another. And, you know, you want to go home at the end of the day. Yeah. And one of the biggest things, I know a lot of guys, and I'm sure you've seen it too, working in the mines, like you get a job pop up. Oh, it's a five-minute job. You know, pretty much every company has a lockout tagout procedure. Yep. Five minute job. You know, I'm not walking all the way down here, you know, cut the power, lock it out, tag it out, jump in there. And I actually had a buddy had that same mindset. It was close to the end of the day, you know, fixing to get off work. Something broke. And he was like, shit, it won't take 10 minutes. And everybody was like, you need to go, you know, lock it out. Oh, hey, I'm not doing that shit. It'll take me 10 minutes. I'm going to jump in there and get it done. So I actually went to go lock it out for him on the way there. You know, it still had power. You know, everything was energized. Um, he was working on, I think it was a, a roller in one of the steel mills. Um, one of the, I think it was either the grease line or one of the water cooling lines that shoots down on the, the steel had broke and i mean it, it wasn't a hard fix at all i mean it literally it would have took 10 minutes um but when he got done with it he had hollered at one of the operators and said hey bump it let me make sure it's working and he was still down in the hole they bumped it and he had on a like long baggy shirt shirt got caught up his shirt sleeve got caught up and it pulled his arm through the roller and just absolutely just mangled it jesus all because you know he didn't want to take five minutes to walk down there and lock it out because he was going to have to go down there and pull the lock again to make them run it and see if it you know was doing what it's supposed to and they ended up having to amputate his arm like mid bicep i mean it just it absolutely just tore it to shreds yeah but i mean yeah a roller <laughs> yeah and it's just, yeah. I mean, the gap on the roller was about that wide. Yeah, I completely mean, can you your arm. Yeah. And, I mean, it's just like we were saying. I mean, you can do everything right, but there's still that 1% chance. And like him, he, he probably thought, you know, I'm good. You know, I've done everything right. Hey, you know, jog this and see if it works. But that 1% is what got him. That's right. Yeah. You got to watch out. You got to be safe. That's it's hard and it's easy at the same time. I mean, you know in the back of your head that safety, you want to go home at the end of the day. You don't want to go home missing limbs or anything like that, but no. there's also that in the back of your head to get the fucking job done and get it done now. 
Yeah. So it's hard, but. And a lot of that, you know, time. depends on what type of boss you have too. Cause I'm, I'm sure you've had them too, where you've got those bosses that are just real hard asses and they're like, Hey, you know, get the damn job done. Yep. And I've never actually personally worked for him, but, um, when we were working for another company, um, like traveling, doing maintenance inside the steel mills, there was another, um, boss inside the company and that's how he was like he was a real hard ass everybody hated working for him you know he was one of those like hey get this shit done now like i don't care what you got to do get it done get it done quick and there he always had somebody on his crew that was always getting hurt i mean and it, it was never anything that was directly their fault it was just one of those like where you're in a rush you know you're not paying attention to everything yeah. that's going on you know you might be paying attention to the majority of it but you're always going to miss that one small thing and that one small thing is normally what's going to bite you yeah yeah you're right yeah. he'd he'd have guys you know fall twist their ankles had one guy fell on a a, a piece of uh not conduit it, yeah i'm sure you know what i'm talking about the um the tubing with the holes in it that you always hang like electrical conduit on. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't think of what it's called right now. Um, but he actually had a guy slip off of a beam and fall onto that on his ribs and broke three of his ribs just cause you know, he was like, Hey, you know, hurry up, get your ass down in there in the hole. And guy was trying to hurry up and get in there, slip, come down on it and broke three ribs on the right side. And he was off work for like two weeks. Jesus. Like I try anytime, like I've got guys working under me, you know, I, I'll tell them every morning, like, I'm never going to put you in a situation that I wouldn't put myself in. I'm not going to ask you to do something that I wouldn't do myself. Like, yes, let's, you know, let's get the shit done, wrap it up, get to the house. But at the same time, be safe. If you don't feel safe doing something, tell me, I'm never going to, I'm never going to say anything or, you know, bitch somebody out for trying to be safe. Cause at What's the end right? of the day. We've all got families we want to get back home to. Like, I like that you brought that up. That if you don't feel safe, then tell you or you know don't do it because in these industries, in this world of blue collar, when your boss is telling you get the fucking job done and get out there and do it, and you go and you start doing this, and if you encounter that part where you're like, I shouldn't do this. The first reaction is, well, I'm, I'm not going to go tell my boss because I'll get fucking fired. Yeah. So you do it anyways, knowing in your head that this is probably, I shouldn't probably do this. Yeah. And guys, if you're watching this, if you're ever in that position where you don't feel safe and in your, your gut is telling you don't do it, don't fucking do it. Yeah. You know, it, just don't do it. It's not, it's not worth it. And it's usually going to be like your younger guys coming into the trades. That's right. Because, you know, guys like me and you, you tell us, get your ass in there and fucking do it. I don't care. You're going to get told, go fuck yourself. Yeah, I'm walking. I'll yeah. fucking drag up real quick. I will track. Like, I don't have a game box. Like, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Dante Terrell. Like, he makes the songs about welding. No. Um, I'll, uh, I'll send you a link to some of his songs later. But, yeah. uh, like... I, I live by his motto, no game box, just the bag, homie. Never know when you're going to drag it. <laughs> I, I have a backpack that I have all of my major tools that I'm going to need. Like, I've got my chipping hammer, uh, you know, my wire brush, my cordless grinder, you know, anything that I'm going to need, you know, to weld. I've got in a bag with my welding hood strapped to the front of it. And if you piss me off, I don't have to holler for a forklift to come get my box and go load it in my truck. I'm throwing my backpack on, and my ass is walking to yeah, the cave. Yeah, you're gone. <laughs> but you are right. It is a lot of younger men and women yeah. that are coming into this field, and you know they're they're trying to make it for themselves. So I understand that they don't want to fuck it up by saying, "No, I'm not doing that." Yeah, because you're scared. Once again, you're scared of getting fired. You're scared of losing that job, that money, and then you don't. You know, a lot of their the thinking is that if I get fired from this, am I going to be able to go find another job doing it? Exactly. And the answer is, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the There's demand is very there. high. Yeah. If anybody watching this is, is thinking, 
if you leave a job, am I going to be able to find? I promise you, being in the blue collar trade, you are not job scared. There are always people hiring. And it's usually they hire with better pay and better benefits. Yeah, especially nowadays. The pay is amazing. It's outstanding. Yeah. Like, I will say that's one thing that COVID did do because, you know, nobody could work while COVID yeah. was going on. And everybody was getting, you know, the checks, you know, the COVID checks to stay at home every month. And like, unemployment, you know, was what a thousand dollars or more depending on where you lived with the price of living yeah and there was so many people that when they were like okay you know everybody can go back to work nobody wanted to go back to work and i know it, it hit the blue collar trade too because you know a lot of those guys were used to working you know six seven days a week for months at a time well they got a taste of you know having to be at home and i know some of them were like you know i don't want to go back to work uh, this is actually, you know, kind of nice. I'm going to find, you know, a little fab shop job somewhere close to the house. You know, it might not be as, you know, great a pay, but I'll still be home every day. That's right. And the blue collar trades were really hurting, you know, trying to get people to come back to work. And I know the last time I heard, I know the Boilermakers Union here, like their top out journeyman pay was like almost $35 an hour, like 34 and some change. And that was just for day shift. I mean, if you were on night shift, you got a shift differential of like $2. So you're making almost $37 an hour. We had a guest on our podcast that uh, he was a uh, oil rig uh, worker. He was actually a, a deck hand. Uh, no, Derek hand. My bad. Yeah. Well, people are going to give me shit for saying that one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he was explaining like, you know, just starting green you're walking onto the rig he said right off the bat them guys are making and this was in canada he was working they're making 750 a day 750 dollars a day he says that's what they're per diem and they're starting off at like it was like 40 something an hour or 50 an hour and that's Ridiculous. dude that's money 750 yeah. a day it's cash yeah. So that blue collar, that's the way to do it. You rake me in somewhere making seven fifty a day. I'm sure enough dragging up and headed that way. <laughs> yep. Or excuse my truck. I'm out of here. Yeah. That's what got me with um the buddy of mine that he called me about, you know, taking his job. Um we were sitting there talking <clears throat> and he was like, Yeah, you know, you'll get you take my spot, you get a company truck fully tooled out you know it's got every tool that you could want on it welder all that you get a company fuel card you get to take the truck home um he was like you get you know he was like anywhere between 36 and 38 dollars an hour starting off leading the truck he was like just go talk to him he said with your background you know you'll probably get 38 starting off um uh, there's a lot of perks in that yeah and then when he said the little p word per diem <laughs> Um, he said 120 a day per diem for anywhere. Like if you're going to be home every night, obviously you're not going to get the per diem, yeah. but anywhere where you're going to stay overnight, 120 a day per diem and you get paid drop, you get paid your hourly rate drive time there and back. So like they're in Memphis right now, they left yesterday going to Memphis. Um, so from Jasper to Memphis, it's two and a half right at three hours okay. so they made almost a hundred dollars just driving to the job site yeah. yeah it's awesome <laughs> yeah just an extra hundred dollars to drive and then like it's a i think he said it was like a little three-day shutdown um so they'll make you know 360 on per diem that, that's that's the check working at mcdonald's yeah like, working a full week at mcdonald's making $360 versus, you know, just your per diem for three day, a three day work day at 120 a day. Like, I mean, just the benefits for it. I mean, it's stupid, crazy. Yeah. The money's there. Just got to chase yeah. it. And he said most of the time, like he said, this company's apparently the owner used to, you know, do the same type of work. You know, he was on the road 24 seven, you know, never home, 
And he was just one of those guys that was like, you know, hey, I'm, you know, I'm tired of doing this. I'm going to start my own thing. So he tries to keep most of his guys to where they're home every night. That's like, awesome because he, if he they went don't, Yeah. Like, he's got a bunch of contracts with, you know, steel mills around here, um, like big commercial scrap yards, you know, that are always needing, um, like, maintenance done on equipment, you know, need, you know, stuff welded or, you know, whatever. Um, so he's got enough work to where you, he can pretty much keep everybody close to home, home every night. And Zach said, usually, you know, maybe four times a year, you'll have to go, you know, stay somewhere. And he said, normally it's going to be like Memphis or, um, over in Columbus, Mississippi, there's two steel mills over there that they service. Columbus is an hour and 45 minute drive from my house. So, I mean, if I really wanted to, I could drive there and back every day. Yeah. Yeah. Working a 10 hour day. I mean, drive the hour and a half hour, 45 minutes there, work your 10 hours and then drive back home and still be home every day. Yeah. Ain't bad. No. When I was working underground, um, I was driving to the mine where we dropped underground. It was an hour and, 15 minutes from my house working a 12 hour shift. So, I mean, you're putting in 14 and a half hours every day, regardless. Yeah. And the worst is driving back home after you did that shift. It's horrible. Kills you. That's what everybody, like when I was working, everybody said, well, what's the worst part of working underground? The drive back home. Yep. Because I, I mean, granted I was on day shift, so I was waking up at three 30 every morning, getting ready, heading out the door. Cause I had to be there by six. So normally, well, we had to be there by six when we were dropping by six thirty. Um, so I'm walking out of the house by like four thirty, and then driving. You know, your hour and fifteen there, working your twelve hour shift, coming back up at six thirty in the evening. It's dark when you get there. It's dark when you leave, and then having to turn around and drive an hour and fifteen minutes back home. Well, by the time you get home, you know it's damn eight o'clock eat shower and hit the bed it's hard it's that's yep i did those shifts i did uh one in the morning to it was either 3 30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon and then by the time you're done your shift you go home which i didn't live very far and you go home but you eat dinner you shower you get about an hour to hang out with the family and then you have to get to bed because you have to wake up and you got like four hours of sleep and you can run Keep going. Yeah, it's amazing what your body can get used to when it's when it's stuck in that position for so long. It is, especially when you're shotgun and you know Red Bulls. Yeah. <laughs> I will say. Um, been... what? Have you ahead. ever? Do what? Go ahead. What are you gonna say? Oh, I was gonna say, have you ever heard of a, a nine-hour energy? Yeah. Yeah. You take a five-hour <laughs> energy and you put it into a four loco. Yeah, you might not know what you're seeing half the day, but no. you're you're doing it. You're doing good. You're gonna see sounds and smell colors. Yep. Well, Devin, it was awesome having you on our podcast. I'm truly honored to have you on, man. It was great. Oh, I enjoyed it. Um, anything you want to tell the younger generation that's trying to join into the blue collar? Just remember what we said. You know, above all things, keep yourself safe. Like, don't let anybody put you in a situation that you feel like it's unsafe because at the end of the day, you just want to make it back home. Yes, the money is great. You know, the lifestyle that it can give you is great. You're going to put in a lot of hours. Depending on what you're doing, you're going to miss birthdays, holidays, you know, graduations. You're going to miss funerals. Um, You're going to lose a lot of people, you know, that you work with. You know, it's just hazards of the job, but... Above all, you know, just watch out for yourself. You know, no job, no amount of money is ever worth your life. That's so right. just always put safety first. As as hard as that is to get in a routine of, like, I know me per, from personal experience, you know, it took me years to really just think about, you know, this isn't safe. You know, I need to take a step back and reevaluate it. So above all else, just try to get into a mindset of safety first and once you get in that you know routine 
you won't just be looking out for yourself. You know, you'll catch yourself looking out for the people that you work with, your brothers, your sisters. You know, it's it's not just you out there. I, the blue collar lifestyle really is a brotherhood. You truly are your brother and your sister's keeper when we're out there on the job because you're going to spend most of the time you're going to spend more time with them than you are your actual family. That's a hundred percent right. Yes. That was great advice. So once again, man, it was awesome having you on here. I appreciate you being our guest. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll have to talk to you again. Oh yeah, for sure. I enjoyed it. That's awesome. All right, man. We'll talk to you later. All right, man. All right. Have a good one. All right. Bye.